All right, who's not dead? Sound off. Two centuries. Nearly two centuries since the days of the Old Kingdom. The realm of Marathon, the Great Valley, has fallen into disarray. Cities asunder, broken roads, the Red Dawn, all at the mercy of her avenging angels, the shapeless devils. Though the city and its white walls were spared, nothing beside remains but a stony ruin. The beasts have come, and the gates are laid open. Desperate measures. Lowborn sons and daughters, abducted under cover of night, are forged into soldiers. They alone would face the dark, as the hand and the fist had the sword of man ere the breaking of the world. Many would not survive the divinations, but those that emerged were warriors of inconceivable might, dressed with eyes of silver. And those that beheld these machines of war would know them as the sons and daughters of the hunt. The Venatores, the hunters. Historically speaking, the exact dates of the Age of Silver are not well known. A lot of Atlan scholars concurred that the fall of the Empire of Marathon was the beginning of the Age of Silver, and even use it as the Anno Domini of the Standard Calendar. From their perspective, being a direct continuation of said empire, they believed that the shattering of Ani, the moon of Teria, heralded the birth of the Grimir, the shapeless devils of the West, and directly caused the Empire to collapse. This story is generally agreed upon in Ovenist doctrine, but the chronology is totally messed up. Some Gaian and Mistran accounts suggest that the migrations began well before the Empire collapsed, as many tribesmen are counted facing off against Imperial patrols. But that differs significantly from the Atla narrative, and although every historical account agrees that Ani's death led to the Grimm's invasion of Marathon, it's never been proven that the two are even remotely connected. Empirically speaking, the Grimm could have just been native to the far west and were forced east when the sky started falling. There are many more dust deposits in the west than in Marathon, so it might be that Marathon was just lucky. It gets even more confusing when some scholars argue that the Age of Silver never ended, that the Golden Age of the Empire was what came before, and that we are currently in its wake. Either way, there's no factual understanding of what happened during the fall. All historians have are disparate eyewitness accounts of the moon bursting open and an invasion of shadowy creatures never before seen by human eyes. So, the date of the fall is generally agreed upon as 0 AE, after Empire. But no one alive has any guess as to the actual date, nor any enlightened understanding on how or why Ani suddenly died. Nevertheless, Atlan scholars approximate the Age of Silver, the era succeeding the fall, between 0 and 500 AE, when the Atlan state officially transitioned into a feudal society. The Age of Silver is also referred to as the First Era by other nations. Likewise, the ages afterwards are the Second and Third Era. Marathon is a patch of land that neighbors the Eastern Ocean. It's separated from the rest of Teria by a mountain range that was originally called the Modernus, the Sea Mountains, because they curve like a wave into the northern cliffs and the sea. Marathon as a term actually derives from the Modernus, the land of the Sea Mountains. The term Boros, or Boros, is derived from the cliffsman word for hill home, Borum. Geographically, the region is split into two major areas, each with their own two subregions. Marathon proper is everything north of the Seiros, and Seiros is the region surrounding the Seiros River. Marathon proper is split between the highlands and the lowlands. 
The highlands are arid tundras that follow the spine of the Boro Mountains, and the lowlands are filled with grasslands and forests. The highlands are where the Grameer invaded the hardest, which leads many people in the modern day to believe that its cold, lifeless terrain is a result of this migration. It's not, but the feeling nonetheless stays. The Great Cliffs are where most cliffsmen are descended from. Their ancestors lived in those hills as tribesmen, but migrated south when the fall wreaked havoc. Most of them would settle further south near the Seiros and the province of Atlas, but some remained further north in the grassland steppes, fields of green grass and the occasional hill leading up into the northern highlands. The forests down south were equally unassuming, timberlands and rolling hills filled with all sorts of wildlife. It made for a much better region to permanently settle in. Seiros's northern bank is a lush floodplain with some of the most arable land in all of Marathon, while its southern bank is largely mountainous with no major rivers leading into it. This is why most of the free banks are on the northern shore, and why a majority of Marathon's population in the Second Age lived in this region. Its cities were the most developed as well, largely in part to its ability to process raw goods that floated down from the north. Half of the Seiros River itself is actually a lake. It feeds out through a narrow passage into a much larger body of water, and continues downhill into the Golden Delta, through which it arrives in the ocean. That passage is often considered throughout all of history as the most geographically sensitive position in all of Marathon. Whoever controls it controls the entire region, as the free banks make for a natural epicenter of Marathon's international economy. All it takes is one dam to shut that all down. But why is it called the Age of Silver? There are three distinct meanings to the phrase. It was an era of never-ending warfare, where only the strongest and smartest survived. And as stated before, it also succeeded what many consider the Golden Age of Marathon, hence the term Silver. But it was also, more notably, the age of the very first hunters, who all had silver eyes. This was because, unlike in the modern day, hunters were not trained in a monastery or a military academy. Hunters were originally created as a failsafe against the Grim, a last resort. They were superhumans with incredible abilities given to them through years of genetic experimentation, during which many participants died. Even more upsetting were the circumstances in which those participants were chosen. Peasant children in the province of Atlas were abducted from their families and bred into perfect soldiers. They were beaten, drugged, and tested rigorously until they were ready to serve the Empire. Unbeknownst to most in the modern era, the Silver Eyes are a side effect of researchers injecting hunters with Grimir blood in the hopes that it would make them stronger and more agile, or at least on par with the Shapeless Devils. It did, but what researchers didn't anticipate was that those traits passed on to their children, which was a huge problem, and it led to a lot of shit down the road for Atlas and the entirety of Marathon. So, the Age of Silver is remembered specifically because it was the Age of the Hunters. They were created as a last line of defense against the Grimir, which proved to be too much for their militias and conscripted regiments. These super soldiers, with their grimish powers and superhuman strength, single-handedly pushed the Grimir back over the Boral Mountains. That's a little unfair to the hundreds of thousands of other armed forces fighting the Grim, but whether their contribution was big or not, everyone remembers the Age of Silver for its silver-eyed champions. But the fact that they could pass these traits onto their children was alarming, because once these superhuman soldiers realized that they could pretty much get away with anything, discipline among the hunters slowly spiraled into a crisis. Hunters would demand higher pay and influence than their unspecial peers, 
lest they desert the Empire and start their own tribes, or worse, help the migrating cliffsmen. In extreme cases, some would go berserk and kill anything that moved. Atlas was ill-prepared to fight the Grimm, but they were even less capable of fighting their own superhuman soldiers. The most well-known of these bold hunters were the Drakens, who captured the capital Atlas, Solidus, and executed the Security Council established after the fall. Their members were cruel, impatient, and untrustworthy. They ruled with an iron fist, purged the realm of their enemies, and plunged most of it into civil war by the time they were inevitably bought out by the Rafgears 50 years later. And despite the Rafgears relaxing many obligations of the hunters, whom they called the Venatores, it coincided with a slow and morbid realization that Atlas had inadvertently created a new kind of post-human nobility. Hunters were treated with the utmost respect and admiration, feared for their ungodly abilities, and followed for their unwavering courage. They made for excellent warriors and led soldiers into battle on countless occasions. But when they actually wanted something, there was very little anyone could do to deny them. They would regularly abuse their superhuman abilities to get what they want, killing whomever they chose, raping and looting whatever they saw fit. Pirate kings with silver eyes ravaged the coast of the Seros, and bandit lords pillaged the countryside. Meridius the Lord Sentinel knew not what he wrought when the Venatores came into being. He gave unto Atlas an impossible army, one that would not only push the Grim back beyond the Boros, but change the fabric of Atlan society forever. One way or another, those that conquer and consummate are those strong enough to endure. By creating this army to save Atlas, Meridius had inadvertently doomed its people. For generations past the time of the Dark Wind would revere those that shared in the blood of the Hunters, the Silver-Eyed and their inhuman strength. Meridius didn't save humankind. He built another. This is about saving the future of humanity! Meridius abducting children is cringe! No! No! Counts and lords throughout Marathon would marry their daughters off to hunters in the hopes of establishing their own hunter dynasties. Lands were awarded to them in mass. Entire armies would abandon their commanders in favor, or in fear, of a silver-eyed leader. Over the course of several hundred years, hunters went from a stock of peasant super soldiers to the ruling class of Marathon. If you were born with silver eyes, the lowest position imaginable was as some kind of knight. They were gods among men. Hunters were often given extravagant titles for doing next to nothing. There's the story of Sir Ober and the Tenpennies, where a king gave away so many titles that two or more people would own the same castle at the same time. There was also the First Civil War of Gaius, when local lords were overthrown by a family of hunters without a single major battle. It wouldn't be until several generations after the Age of Silver that these superhuman traits began to dwindle with less and less hunter blood and the ruling class of Marathon returned to a stock of ordinary, charismatic souls. This was a gradual, albeit violent, transition. The dynasties that ruled Marathon were carefully ousted as their demonic powers waned, and when they were unable to strike fear into those beneath them, they were slaughtered like animals. They jump in me! They jump in me! The silver-eyed Countess of Mount Jor, when attempting to flee her city, was beaten and raped by a crowd of protesters before they started eating her alive, hoping to take what power was left in her blood. Relatives of the Drakens, having previously fled persecution, were found in a cellar outside Blackwater and buried alive. The story of Sir Ober and the Tenpennies ends with hunter lords turning a royal ball into a bloodbath, and it's written like a comedy. Flesh of my, flesh of my, no, my, my. The memory of these bold hunters cursed anything to do with them for generations. In some capacity, it may have even inspired Onicism. Having so recently overthrown the Venatores, the priests and lords of Marathon collectively agreed to damn their memory. 
and so reluctantly they extrapolated that the Grimm were actually from the moon and were sent by Ani to punish humankind for their folly. The Venatores were demonized as agents of the underworld. The expression silver-eyed quickly took on a hateful, repugnant connotation, and the act of killing Grimir in and of itself was considered blasphemy. For 700 years, the Grimm trickled back into Marathon, albeit not nearly in the numbers they had before, and the glory of the Empire and the Age of Silver faded from all memory. But there were hunters that remained loyal to Atlas, regardless of the status quo, and it's these hunters whose descendants survive to the modern day. Their more selfish and adventurous peers were either slaughtered or overthrown in gory displays of revolution and usurpation. But those that continued fighting the Grimm and pushing them back over the Boros were not, and in a lot of those cases they continued doing what they were bred to do, regardless of what people thought of them. Feudal accounts make a serious distinction between good and bold hunters, and it's these good hunters that many stories are based off of. Like Sir Alec the Gentle, or the Tale of the Two Cloaks, or even St. Arya's Blessings, good hunters were well known for their chivalry and sense of honor. They helped anyone in need and didn't seek fortune or glory like their more selfish peers. They were sound of mind and dutiful to their families and their countrymen. In a lot of these old stories, they serve as the straight man or the objective truth the author intends to convey. Sometimes you'll even see them perched on a person's shoulders in manuscripts, whispering like a conscience in their head. Even when those abilities began to fade generation by generation and the reputation of the hunters was forever spoiled, good hunters continued a never-ending struggle against the shapeless devils from the west, and they would endure for another millennia. It was these heroic exploits of the Good Hunters, not the Bold, that inspired many at the outset of the Third Era to become hunters themselves. The revelation that the Grimm were actually probably evil changed the way history looked at hunters. No. Well... Overnight, the tyrants and bloodthirsty knights of old were whitewashed into a new public image. Sir Ober, St. Arya, Tyrannus Call, the Steel Sons, and Sir Alec the Gentle went from bedtime stories to the cornerstones of what it meant to be a hunter. Cornerstones that would inspire millions. People in the future would build monasteries, military academies, universities, and all sorts of covens to educate future generations in fighting the shapeless devils, as willed by Ani. And it was those same stories that would later inspire a young silver-eyed girl named Summer Rose to take up the mantle of her ancestors. Like Summer Rose, descendants of the Hunters still endure. Approximately 5% of Marathon at the outset of the Great War had Old Hunter blood and their silver eyes. Ordinary people, Hunter or not, carry the genetic trauma of generations past. A scar on all humankind and a reminder of both Atlas's folly and the selfless sacrifice of the Good Hunters. Just as silver-eyed warriors emerged from Atlas, rumors of wolf walkers and beastmen in the northern highlands scared off many of the migrating cliffsmen, including, for a time, the Mistran. They had never gotten a good look at the rest of Marathon before, and once they did, they realized that humankind was not the only master of Terria. The Faunus are a minority in modern-day Marathon, but in the days of the Old Empire, they lived throughout Terria as an undisputed majority. Humans as we know them are just a different species of that same genus. What we collectively call Faunus are actually a variety of different species that master Terria alongside humans in the Old Empire. Humans just happen to live predominantly in Marathon. There may have even been Faunus Emperors. There's a famous legend about a wolf king named 
Keiro, who prayed to Amos, the sun god, to spare his dying pup. In response, Amos made his daughter part god, thereby immortalizing her. And in thanks, Keiro named her Ani. But because Ani was part god, Amos took her from Keiro, promising to let him see her every night. When Keiro heard this, his tears created the great river, and that's why the river is called the Seiros, from Keiro. It's also supposedly why wolves cry at the moon. It's the corpse of their daughter. Nonetheless, humans were never alone in Marathon, and in its golden age lived side by side with the kingdoms and dominions of other hominids across Teria. When Ani fell, Marathon was spared of the destruction that racked the rest of Teria. As a result, it's speculated that very few Faunus survived the fall. Those that did were concentrated near the Boro Mountains, and throughout the years, their populations have stagnated. The most successful survivors are the Wolfwalkers and the Adari, wolfmen and part felines respectively. Wolfwalkers coexisted with the Empire inside Marathon and made up a huge portion of their armies. Most of the survivors were soldiers of the Maranor, stationed along the Northern Highlands. Their similarity to wolves is only partial. Pointed ears, nocturnal vision, more hair on their body, and a small tail. Likewise, the Adari were originally nobles of a southern desert kingdom who migrated over the Seiros to escape the Grim. They have sharper faces, slim bodies, less hair than a wolfwalker, but a longer tail. There are also smaller groups of Faunus that lived in Marathon during the Age of Silver. Some of them would unfortunately die out before the Great War, but hey, I'm not losing sleep over it. The ones I'm at liberty to distinguish are the Sea Suns, fish people that migrate up and down the coast depending on the time of year, hence the concept of seasons. The Rualar, lizard people that also migrated from the southern desert, and a populous race of wolfwalkers that lean closer to humans than otherwise, simply called the Tamed. The Tamed are obviously a mix of humans and wolfwalkers over generations of cross-pollination. The Tamed are a popular example of the Faunus being systematically breeded out by a sapien majority, but cross-pollination happens elsewhere as well. The Adari are a lot more closely knit, so not a lot happens there, but true or not, Faunus blood is everywhere in Marathon with the major exception of the Cliffsmen tribes. And that's why Cliffsmen are a lot more hot-blooded about things like racial purity than, say, the Keri. But were there Faunus hunters? Originally, no. Meridius exclusively used Sapiens for his experiments, for obvious reasons. But later on in the Age of Silver, cross-pollination took place without a doubt. So there very well could be silver-eyed wolfwalkers or Adari in the Age of Silver. And there very well could still be silver-eyed wolfwalkers or Adari in the Great War. It'd be extremely Mary Sueish and dumb, but it's entirely possible. Religion in the Age of Silver is a mixed bag. While old traditions were clinging for dear life, a new mythos was spreading across Marathon. But nothing was or would be more central to their fate than the death of Ani. The shattering informed religions and societies across the world, and in Marathon it would form the backbone of pretty much everything. Previous religious systems were rocked to their core, and the faithful scrambled to make sense of what exactly happened. The immediate response varied from culture to culture. The more pious wolfwalkers, owing to their traditions, were grief-stricken at the death of Cairo's immortal daughter, thinking that she was murdered by the Grimir, who promptly invaded Marathon afterwards. The Cliffsmen initially believed that the Empire was somehow at fault and the Empire, in all its chaotic consolidation, thought that a meteor or a comet slammed into it. 
Clans from the southern desert extrapolated that the sun was jealous of the moon and hurled a fireball at it. But ultimately, no one knew exactly what happened. Shards of her corpse crashed all across Teria. The pious would douse their spears and swords in the dust of Ani, her blood, to grant them strength and spirit. The less pious would feast on it, refining the powder into toxic substances and hard drugs. Hunters and nobles would spread it over their bread to awaken their power inside of them, and sometimes it was even used as a reverse contraceptive to conceive stronger offspring. In layman's terms, they put it on their cock. It littered marathon in dells and burrows, cracked open by balls of white light filling the air with a silver ash. When the survivors emerged, they found the corpse of Ani lingering in the sky, and for the next 200 years, logical or not, it fueled their vengeance against the Grimm. But things took a turn when the hunters seized power. Before that point, Marathon's old religions endured in a variety of forms. Atlas and the Maranor still worshipped Amos and prayed for Ani's resurrection through the extermination of the Grimm. The Adari continued praising the sun and fighting off what they called the moon's shadows. And the Cliffsmen believed the moon's death was a punishment, stripping the empire of all name. But when the Venatores emerged as a silver-eyed nobility and oppressed Marathon for centuries, these separate faiths gradually turned on them, and the result was a melting pot of ideas and traditions that arose in the early kingdoms of the Gaians, known in retrospect as Onicism. The Age of Silver was largely bereft of Onicism, but it does emerge in this time period. The basic gist is that man grew jealous of the half-god princess in the sky, and so in their hubris they struck her down, unleashing her avenging angels across the world. Anicism was a religion of penance, its processions were much more akin to funerals and wakes than traditional masses, and from birth people were expected to constantly apologize to Ani as a sort of original sin. The first Anasist temples were monuments with stones that followed the position of the moon in the night sky. Using, inhaling, or even touching dust was considered blasphemy. And for hundreds of years, Marathon came to a technological standstill. While Marathon was eager to condemn the memory of their tyrannical hunters and worship their moon mommy, the morality of the Grimm was never really addressed properly. The insinuation that they were Ani's angels, or that they might even be her children, was an alarming theological precedent. After all, the religion itself was just a political tool for revoking the rights of the Venatores. A lot of splinter creeds made distinctions on whether they were good or evil and some of the more popular ones settled with them being rogue and morally correct to kill in self-defense. But the distinction was largely for self-defense. No one made an active argument that the Grimm were to be exterminated or even hunted. That wouldn't be until the Third Era. In the Age of Silver, though, everything is leading up to Onicism. The crimes of the Venatores, the dust of Ani, and especially the Grimm. But for a time, the old ways reigned. The Cliffsmen still held power in a name and worshipped the life of the Earth. The Imperials still believed that Amos and Ani were on their side, and even thought the Grimm may have been responsible for the fall. And the Faunus that survived refused to let the Shattering shake their faith. Thankfully, their traditions, written or not, would continue to endure through Anicism as part of its diverse and colorful canon.
but that is an insultingly simple synopsis of over 500 years of war. In that time, cities were raised, kingdoms rose and fell, entire dynasties were snuffed out. There's so much history that was lost and found and lost again in the Age of Silver. And despite modern scholars' best efforts, a lot of it remains in total obscurity. The most of it that's spoken, ironically, is in fables and bedtime stories. Because to the people of Marathon, the past is more fantasy than fact. But their lessons of honesty, selflessness, and honor live on. And whether they have silver eyes or not, they teach future generations what it means to be human. To be a survivor in the remnants of the old world.